Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Sunday Talk within the Nine-Sided Circle. I'm one of your two hosts, Nor Kyle. And I am the other one of your two hosts, who is not Nor Kyle, Mushtaq Ali. And as always, if you are new here, we're so excited to have you for the first time. And if you are not new here, we are excited to have you. Come visit us once again. It's always lovely to have familiar faces here as well as new ones. Thank you so much. And uh, hmm, I guess we need to do a little bit of a spiel. Yeah, but not as much of a spiel as we used to. So why don't you lead the way there? Yeah. All right. So um, thanks for being here. And if you're watching us on YouTube, we would ask a couple of things from you. One is that you like this video. Hit that like button. We, we need to get the like so we can get up in YouTube's arcane algorithm and so more people can find this. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, let me encourage you because we actually have door prizes sometimes. If you subscribe, you may win a door prize. We don't know, but it is possible. And if so, we would actually mention you on this channel. And then you'd have to figure out how to get the door prize, but it will happen. So door prizes, subscriptions, we love them. Um, also, we would really, really take kindly to your comments on this video or any other video you'd like yes. to comment on. We thrive on your comments. They are extremely useful to us. We love to read them. We love to answer them. And we oftentimes get good ideas from them. Sometimes people come up with stuff that we haven't thought of and we steal it from them and file off the serial numbers and give a new paint job and claim that we knew it all the time. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, uh, so you give can us your comments. give us your comments, ask us your questions, you know, as long as it's all in good faith and sometimes even when it's not, we are happy to answer anything. Yeah, you we may usually have to share ignore trolls unless they're particularly funny, in which case we'll put you up. So. Right, yeah, but thankfully we don't have much of that at all and we love to dialogue with all of you so feel free leave your questions leave your ideas any feedback you might have and we'll get back to you and we're happy to have you join in the conversation so i guess with that said uh you can also participate by joining us on our facebook forum by liking our page and all that stuff, we have links below in the description, and you can donate you can actually, if yeah. you'd like to support our work. That's one of the easiest ways to do it, and it helps us a lot because most of what we do, in fact, everything we do on YouTube, we do without any paywally type stuff or anything like that. It is 100% for free. Yeah, except that we we whine and snivel until somebody makes a donation sometimes. <laughs> so if you want to shut us up, you know, yeah. feel free to kick us a couple bucks. All right, so. And there's another thing. Ooh, what what's the other thing? thing? There was another thing. Um, and it totally slips my mind. Damn. Well, if it comes oh, well, back to you, you know, we will yeah, revisit that. Oh, yes. I know what it was. If you would like to be part of the live show, I love saying that, live, live show. show. Uh, <laughs> there are two ways to do that. One, join our mailing list and you will receive an invitation to uh, our talks. Or two, uh, join the forum on Facebook and you'll receive invitations to our talks. And if you want to get in on the action, we welcome you. So. Uh, do one of these two things, or both, and get the invitation twice. And if you can there manage you know. to show up twice at the same time, that's even better. We're very generous in that way. <laughs> All right, so you've joined us for most likely a conversation about the topic at hand, which is, ooh, we're going to be talking about the Sarmoon Brotherhood. Very spooky, very secret. Gasp. Yes, very clandestine, all of that stuff. And uh, there's a lot that has been written about it. And there's a lot of like 
mythos and hype and drama surrounding the Star Moon Brotherhood. And Which is we're a polite talk way, about way of saying bullshit. <laughs> I am being very uh, nice about it. Yes, yep. there there is plenty of bullshit to sort through if we're going to have a conversation of any substance about the Sardine Brotherhood. So, yeah. Where should we start? Um, we should start with a little bit of history. Yes, please so, do. The first mention of the Sardine Brotherhood was in the... Um, Books of G. I. Gurdjieff was the first time that we ever see that name. There are, are no places where that name shows up anywhere <clears throat> before that that I know of. And if I don't know of it, it must not exist. Uh, and it was specifically in his second book, Meetings with Remarkable Men, where he talked about the Sarmoon Brotherhood as a, a special mystical secret monastery somewhere high in the Hindu Kush mountains or some such thing um, where he went and learned various secrets. Now in this he was following a tradition that had been well established for quite some time and is still used today. Madame Blavatsky used the same thing and Aleister Crowley used the same thing. Madame Blavatsky built her theosoph Theosophical Society around talking to the Ascended Masters, the Secret Chiefs, these people that only she could talk to who uh, told her all of this cool stuff that she then wrote down and was the, uh, the gatekeeper for it. Crowley did the same thing with his Secret Chiefs and being you know, given all of these special initiations into stuff. And you can follow that back for quite a ways. This idea of there are super powered human beings that are hiding out somewhere in the far reaches of the world in the Himalayas or in somewhere in the mountains of Central Asia or what have you. And they will from time to time pick an emissary to come in and disseminate the truth and then you're supposed to follow that person. While this is a great trope for fantasy novels, this ain't how it works. Um, yeah, I mean, how many times have we seen that in yeah. kinds of literature within without quotes, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've seen it, uh, God, almost everybody. Carlos Castaneda with Don Juan and Don Gennaro, right? These two guys who uh, nobody ever heard of. Um, and the further you get in the books, the more absurd they get. Um, who else? Uh, Tuesday Lobsang Rampa. Very, very popular cat back in the 1960s. Uh, Tibetan Lama uh, had great, incredible psychic powers given to him by a, uh, a brain operation, of all things. Uh, except that uh, he wasn't Tibetan. He was an Englishman and I think a plumber who basically read the Theosophical Society stuff and co-opted it and started writing these books. And for the longest time, people bought into him. And then when he was found out, he claimed that, oh, the body is English, but the soul is actually a Tibetan Lama and who swapped in because the other guy didn't want to live anymore. Uh, and on and on. This is a very, very common trope. So there are a lot of suggestions as to the meaning of the word Saramun. Um, and if you, you've seen the graphic that we use for the, the opening slide on this, I wrote the word out in Persian and in Old Persian, because uh, you find the word in both places. And uh, sure we made it.
and there's uh, you know there's all of these interpretations uh, but the the most obvious interpretation has never been touched upon as far as I know and we're going to do that tonight we're going to tell you the most obvious meaning for the word Sarmun. Nobody else has ever mentioned this that I know of, which is weird. It's very weird. It but, is very weird. Yeah. Yeah. Hold your breath on that because we're, we're going to get to it. Now, the thing is, is that people get the idea that there is this secret brotherhood out there who is holding all of the cards. And if you're really lucky, they're going to contact you or you might be able to go out and find them, in which case they will teach you cool things. And this is not actually the case. Ospensky, Gurdjieff's student who wrote a lot of pretty decent material about uh, Gurdjieff's work, had this idea that if that this the secret chiefs the Sarmun or the the world brotherhood should contact him at some point if he proved himself and he died without this happening and that was a, a great uh, disappointment to him now I know other people who have gone looking for the Sarmun and one guy and uh, we were just talking about him last night. He went out and he looked all over the place for the Sarmun. He went to Turkey. He went to uh, Afghanistan, even though it was really dangerous. He went all over these places and he never found them. And so he came to, to the conclusion that they don't exist. It was just a story. Without ever asking the most important question, which is, why would they want you? People who go around trying to find the Sarmun are usually not people that the Sarmun would want. Consider that. So, who are the Sarmun? What is the secret? I can tell you exactly where the group that was given this name by Gurdjieff originated. And that was in northern Iran, in uh, the ten hundreds, in the province of Khorasan, and in the, uh, the town of Hamidan, which is way up in northern Iran. There was a fellow, his name was Yusuf, Yusuf Hamadani, they called him, who he didn't exactly spring full grown from the, the flower of a lotus or anything, but uh, he began teaching. He could uh, trace his lineage all the way back to the prophet, and, you know, like most Sufi teachers. And he gathered some students around him and he moved from uh, the south way up to north to uh, Bukhara where he spent most of his life and he trained uh, he had uh, what, 12 disciples that he moved with sounds familiar right uh, and he trained some very very powerful people over the time in a methodology that is quite a bit different than what we usually think of with uh, Sufism. Um, it wasn't the ecstatic, um, you know, dance around, sing songs to God kind of thing. It wasn't uh, the God is everything and we are just his, his servants. It was something much more radical than that. Whereas uh, a lot of the Sufis before him and after him had the idea of fana, of annihilation, he preferred to talk about itlak, which means liberation. And 
from him descend several Sufi orders. Uh, he had his four main uh, successors. Uh, he died in 1143. His first successor was named uh, Abdallah Barki, and he taught in this school for a while, died. Uh, and then Hassan al Andaki uh, became the second successor. He also did not live that long. Um, and when he died, there was no one to follow him within the main body of the school. So uh, one of the other students of uh, Yusuf Hamadani, uh, the first and only uh, Turkish student at that time, his name was Ahmed Yasevi. Um, he was appointed one of uh, Hamadani's Khalifas and he was sent uh, quite far to the east, to, uh, around uh, out into uh, Uzbekistan, basically into uh, Chinese Turkestan. And the, the main school sent for him, and he came back and assumed the mantle of uh, the sheikh for three years while he trained up uh, the next person to take over, whose name was Abd al-Khalaq al-Hujdwani. Uh, and these two guys, Ahmed Yusevi and Abd al-Khalaq, are the, the people you want to keep an eyeball on. Uh, these two, each, each were uh, in a line of a particular group of Sufi orders that sprang from them. Uh, the Yasevi uh, is the, the older of the two and it is considered uh, a direct line from uh, Yusuf Hamadani and, and in the direct line of the school, as is Abd al So you have two direct lines, one of which stayed in Bukhara, one of which moved east. Each taught something slightly different. Um, the Yasevis were um, very much interested in music and movement, uh, in physical exercise, uh, and that sort of thing. Whereas the, uh, the the branch that remained in Bukhara was more contemplative. They were more like. Uh, uh, what you might imagine uh, monastic orders would be like. They weren't a monastic order by any means, but that kind of contemplative inwardness. Now, from Ahmed Yusevi came, like I said, you know, two or three different tarikas, the most important of which are the Bektashi. Haji Bektash was uh, a very important figure in Turkish Sufism. And uh, he was the, the founder of the line that gave us Yunus Emre. Uh, if you know who Yunus Emre was, he's uh, considered uh, a poet equal to Rumi, but he wrote in Turkish rather than uh, Persian. And Abd al gave us uh, the Naqshbandi, his, his great student, though he was a couple of generations away, like four generations away, was Bahauddin Naqshband, who was the founder of what became known as the Naqshbandi order, which is one of the largest Sufi orders in the world today. We also, uh, look at the Malamati, who are, uh, the, the Malamati mean the blameworthy, and they were intimately connected to uh, Yusuf Hamadani's uh, lineage. And the Qalandari, uh, 
which are an interesting group. The Kalandar shaved their heads and basically wandered around without any fixed abode. And uh, there's a lot to be said about them. And they were often related to this. Now, this is all by way of saying you have these connections that run through these Sufi orders. And it is known, at least by J.G. Bennett, that Gurdjieff spent two years with uh, a Yasevi Teke in Central Asia. He talks about it in a couple of his books. Um, and it is also uh, pretty evident, because he mentions it in his writings, that uh, Gurdjieff hung out with some Naqshbandis, which are two lines of this. And so here's the secret of, of the Sarmun. The word Sarmun, well, you can look at it and it could mean bee, it could mean uh, the head of the family. In Farsi, it means organization. That's all it means. It means the organization. I was with the Sarmun. I was with the organization. That's all it means. The word, if you look it up in your handy dandy uh, Persian English dictionary, means organization, structure, an establishment, an infrastructure, a regime, a conformation, or a formation. It has all of those kinds of meanings. And so when Gurdjieff said, I, I went to the Sarmun, he was saying, I went to the organization. I realize that this is not nearly as mysterious as tracing this all back to Babylon and uh, Ur of the Chaldees and all of this kind of stuff. And we can do that, but that's all mythology. We can trace it back to Yusuf Hamadani as history. So the thing to note for people who aren't aware of this drama is that typically, as you described earlier, people do try to make this this big hullabaloo about it, right? Mm -hmm. About it being a secret society and... Yeah, the secret super-powered people hanging out in the fringes of the world, secretly manipulating everything. There was one charlatan who shall remain nameless who swore that the uh, that these guys were like the secret chiefs of everything, and he was their emissary, mm -hmm. and uh, he conned a lot of people. So because, when you... Yeah. Sorry. So... Yeah, lots of con artists along the way. But yeah. as you described, uh, it has been claimed by some that this is a lineage or, or an organization that goes all the way back to like explicitly back to Pythagoras. Back to and yeah. yeah. And there are some definite hints towards that, but there's nothing substantial. I mean, there's... There are certainly, I mean, even in Sufism itself, no matter what uh, lineage you're talking about, there are threats that come from the ancient world, just as a matter of course. So, of course, there's going to be breadcrumbs of that, no matter where you look. Yep. And, you know, the Arab world, the Muslim world, had... Uh, writings about Pythagoras when Europeans were still digging their outhouses next to their wells. Right. So, I mean, I, I guess all of this is to say there's nothing particularly mysterious. I mean, there is something special about it in the sense that there was some wonderful things that come out of the, these ancient traditions, and that's not yeah. to be diminished. But it is not necessary to have that quality of the super secret elite to it that people think somehow imbues things with this special magical essence so now we get to the real secret 
you can contact the solder motor. And it's not that hard. It's actually fairly simple. The thing to understand is I, I mentioned these, these Sufi tarika, they call them singular tarika, plural tarikat. So there are these Sufi orders, the Yasevi, the Naqshbandi, the Bektashi, um, the Kalandari, if you can find them and catch them. Uh, some of them, but not all of them, some of them contain a particular set of practices that if you learn them and do them will cause certain things to happen. They will cause you to mature into an adult human being with a conscience. They will cause you to enter into the awakened state more and more often. And they will cause you to eventually reach a state of it luck, liberation. And all you have to do to get the notice of the Sarmoon Brotherhood is to get your hands on those practices and do them and succeed at doing them, get well, well practiced at them. And there you go. You're not going to get a, an owl is not going to come and uh, like deliver an envelope under your door. But you could say that the, the at the level of quantum entanglement, which is, I'm making this up, at the level of quantum entanglement, you become connected. I'm giving that as sort of a metaphor. Now, the thing to know, though, is that you d not every line of, of these different tarikas has this or can give you this. I'd say 99% of the Naqshbandis that you can find in the world today know jack shit. You can tell the Naqshbandis because they dress funny. They all wear the big turbans and all of this kind of stuff and um, very rigid in their thinking and behavior. But and they're my, not the only ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was yeah, going to say are, that. There are some Naqshbandis out there who are not those guys and they're much harder to find. My encounter with the ones that were immediately accessible were, you know, very traditionalist in a rigid sort of way, lots of gender segregation and um, yeah. rote ritual. So yeah, that's that's not exactly yeah. What we're and gender about. segregation in that way is anathema to the actual Sardar Moon. Um, I did a little two and a half minute video on YouTube, which is an old story of Yah Ahmed Yasevi uh, and him being uh, people trying to bust him for uh, not doing the gender segregation thing in his response, which is worth listening to if you haven't and worth listening to again if you have. Um, So, the Yasevi are incredibly hard to find. Uh, the Bektashi, not so much. They're kind of, they are more out there, though again, you have the Bektashi who carry these practices, and then you have the ones who don't. The thing is, though, is these practices are readily available all over the place. Gurdjieff outlines 99% of the available practices in his books. His students, you know, especially Bennett, uh, Kenneth Walker, all of these guys also go over the basic practices. They are, they're out there for free. You don't have to find a secret monastery to get them. All you have to do is look and figure out how to do them and do them. 
that reminds me, you can also find most all of the practices right on this channel. We, we have been putting them out there for free for people to find. And if you need help, we will coach you in how to do them. That's what the comment section is for. If they're really long, we're going to encourage you to email or do all of this other stuff. Set up a time to a, talk yeah, with us. Yeah. Yeah, all of that. But for for basic question and answer, use the use the comments. We'll do our best to, to help you out. So within within the lines of of descent from Yusuf Hamadani. There are a set of practices that will make you a member of the Sarnamun for a lack of a better, better word. You will be part of the organization. And that, and a dime, will no longer get you a cup of coffee. Did you know that at one time a cup of coffee cost a dime? It's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah, it's it, it was shit coffee. It was terrible <laughs> coffee, but you could get it for a dime. So I guess one thing that's important to say is, you know, I said earlier that uh, there is nothing mystical and magical about this. And, you know, I need mean that in the sense that People tend to take for granted what is right in front of them. Yep. And it seems to lack magic and mystery because it's in plain sight. People don't know how to value those things quite as easily. And this is the thing. So a lot of people think that the Yasevi don't exist anymore. This is not true. Uh, but we like to let people think it's true because it keeps them out of our hair. Plus, it's One a lineage the, yeah. that's been given kind of a hard time over the hundreds yeah, of years. Sometimes it, it was given a real hard time when the Soviets uh, took over most of Central Asia. But the thing is, there are some tarikas, and this will include the Naqshbandis who are of this particular line, the uh, pretty much all of the, the tarikas I mentioned, they aren't going to stand out. Um, the Malamatis are, are a great example of this. They, they have no special Sufi dress. If you go to some places like uh, in North Africa or Egypt or um, a, a lot of the uh, southern, for lack of a better term, tidy, because they all have uniforms, you know, special hats and special coats and all of this kind of stuff. And some groups love to wear those all the time to distinguish themselves from regular people. But one of the tenets of uh, the Yasevi and the, the kind of Naqshbandi we're talking about and the Malanati is look normal. Don't stand out. Be as normal as you can possibly be. Of course, this may be, mean that you would change your dress sometimes. When, when I lived in Africa, uh, sometimes I dress like a European, and sometimes I would dress like uh, not an African, but in a, the general garb of the area, which uh, lungis were very popular, which is like a, a sarong. Uh, and the reason for that is because nobody looks twice at you, and it's incredibly cool and comfortable in a very hot climate. But I wouldn't walk around that like that on the streets of Palo Alto.
So, the secret of the Sarmon Brotherhood is that there are no secrets and that the tools that they offer are free to anyone. They are out there. They are readily available. And if you want to join, all you have to do is learn to use the tools. Ain't that weird? No going to secret monasteries high in the mountains, walking across rickety wooden bridges, nothing. Because it's really about putting in the time. It's about putting yeah. in the work. To both learn the practices and to utilize them in a way that is active and transformational. So, all of you are now members of the Sarmoon Brotherhood. Congratulations. Certificates are in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you got to pay for the certificates. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is the basic thing, and this is like the, the thing that I wanted to cover this evening is this idea that um, there are no secrets. There just aren't. There are no secret brotherhoods. I mean, there are Yosevis, which is different than being in the organization. Um, you know, and you could go out and you could become a formal Yosevi dervish if they're willing to take you. But then you'd find them. And like they say, you, there could be a, a Yosebi Teke right next door to you. And it could have been there for 10 years and you would never notice. Because that's how normal they are. People are the attracted same. to the exotic, you know. Yeah. And it's distracting them. Yeah, this, uh, the line of, of these tools is not exotic. You know, a thousand years ago, they dressed funny, but everybody dressed funny, so nobody noticed. Now, if you dress like they did a thousand years ago, everybody will notice. People will look at you weird. They wonder what your mother taught you. But forget about being special. And that's what happens when people want to find the Sarmun, is they want to be special. They want to be one of the elect. And I will tell you, I just realized that I've been talking with that fan on this whole time. My apologies. Um, it ain't about being one of the elect. If you want to be one of the elect, you will never succeed at this it's you got to do the exact opposite you got to let go of wanting to be the master the black belt the whatever it is that you're trying to be and you just have to be just plain folks that's probably a term that, that where i come from uh, they would say, eh, they're just folks, just regular people. And uh, that was not an insult. It was more of a compliment. But the people who look for the Sarmun are often the ones who want to be special. And as my teacher said to me, somebody who wants to be special, I have no use for them. They require too much maintenance. So consider this. There is a line that descends directly from the prophet, and we can go from person to person to person right to um, Yusuf Hamadani. From him, 
we can see how things branched out. And there were other branches of, of individuals before him. He was not like somebody original or special. He was just really good at what he did. Uh, and he, he produced two lines that produced you know, five or six schools that had the tools in them and were passing them out. And Gurdjieff came in contact with them. Was he an emissary of them? I doubt it. Um, I think he, I wouldn't say that his harshest critics say, yeah, he just stole the stuff and ran off with it. I'm not sure that that's the case. I think that they gave it to him and they gave it to him willingly and let him go to see what he would do with it. Like seeding clouds to see if it will rain. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Any thoughts, questions, clarifications? Yeah, I did have a question. If Go for it. the doing of these exercises, the, the use of these tools will get you into the brotherhood or to have a free communication with the brotherhood. What is it about these tools and exercises that appears to be off-putting or, or difficult? That, that <laughs> what is it about them that why there seems to be so few people that are doing it or using them because people don't actually want to be awake when it comes right down to it the work of, of first of all the work of being an adult is hard there are way more growing pains that anybody wants to admit it's pretty yucky. Second of, yeah, yeah yeah and second of all People don't want to be awake. They want to have good dreams. This is why uh, you have Swami Watsasnanda over in India with 10,000 followers, each of whom wants to kiss his feet, and he has nothing. He has two things, jack and shit. <laughs> and yet he will get all of these people who come because he tells them what they want to hear. You get, if you go to a, a Yasevi or a Nakshbandi Teke that are within this line, they are not going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to tell you the truth, and the truth hurts. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But he didn't say that. That, that statement is highly edited. Um, it translates better as, you will know the truth and the truth will really piss you off and then it will make you hugely angry and then you will throw tantrums and then if you hang in there it'll set you free but it's the hanging in there part that most people don't get yeah i mean that's the dark night of the soul type stuff yeah that you and, did not bargain for more often than not yeah i mean people want the good dreams they want uh, the nice stories. They want the fantasies. They want to be a reincarnation of the last high priest of Atlantis. They want to have uh, been abducted by space aliens. They want all of this stuff. People don't want to be awake. Because okay. being awake is not exciting. So, but those, those are fanciful dreams. They're, they're, those type of dreams aren't going to feed you at all. Whereas this Yogi Swami Nanda, with all his students, he's going to be receiving some kind of energy 
with from all his students that are fawning over him. He's, he's getting energy from that. How can these tools and the use of them connect me to something that is going to feed me more than that? That's very tempting. Not that, ever, not, that I could, not that I could ever become a, one of those swamis, of course. The, the who thing knows, is, Jonathan? It would be like, <laughs> in the case of Swami Watsasnanda, uh, it is very much like getting all the McDonald's and Chick fil A you would want. For him, himself. For him, maybe? yeah. 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 It, I, I'm thinking of a particular guy, and I look at him. I know. Every you're, time yeah. I see him, he looks sicker. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he is not healthy as a human He doesn't human look being. well. He doesn't look nourished per se. Yeah. Yeah. If we want to talk about this in... Um, yeah. So what you have in that situation is, is a kind of a feedback loop where uh, the energy is being passed on, but it's, it's being dissipated. He cannot use that energy other than as a vampire. And we yeah. all know that the thing with vampires is that they're dead. He is not amongst the living in a case like that. He is as much a slave to the situation as his students are. These tools will tell you, ah, I don't have to do any of that. You listen to his rap and you will find it boring. An awake human being will listen to that and just experience it as, oh, somebody's painting the wall with dog shit. That's what it feels like. If you will excuse my crudity, we got to be careful so we don't get demonetized now. I can't say dog shit too many times. <laughs> um. The feces of the genus Canid. God. Point taken. Um, well, Aaron says in reply, Jonathan, um, I think these things aren't attractive because you can't do them on autopilot. And even if you could, they seem, quote, boring, unquote, or mundane, quote, unquote, rather than exciting or special. Yeah. that agrees with that yeah yeah and it doesn't matter if there's a lot of pain involved in the illusion because you go to some of these places there's a there's a famous uh teacher who is all about trauma right you go to her and you spend thousands of dollars and she will tell you how to relive your trauma over and over and over again. Uh, and if you run out of trauma, she will help you create more, even if it didn't happen. And people get addicted to that shit, reliving pain, whether it happened or not. See, that's the thing. It's not that, I mean, it depends on the circumstances because there can be. Oh yeah, some of these people get so that is created strung out for on you. it, they kill themselves. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, trauma is a real phenomenon but when you use it as a fuel for the fire of continuing your practice or whatever it is it, it's as if you're seeking out trauma as a resource which is bizarre i mean we've done a talk on healing previously but yeah. when you're creating trauma or provoking trauma in order to use it as fuel for your own practice or for the practice of your followers so that they will be devoted to you. I mean, we've, we've talked about how problematic that is elsewhere. Yeah. The thing to do with trauma is to heal it once and for all and move on. And oftentimes it's easier than it seems. Not all the time, but oftentimes. There's also this phenomenon of wearing trauma as an identity. Yes. So that it becomes all the harder to heal it because if you let go of it, you're letting go of what you perceive to be yourself. 
Yeah, there's there's lots of people who spend years doing inner child work. They spin tales around their inner child and have dialogues with their inner child and all of this kind of stuff. Fact of the matter is, is that the only thing that you're supposed to do with your inner child is to help that kid grow up, help them become adult. You don't need some inner child stuck in you forever, uh, whining and sniveling and getting his nose snot over your entire psyche, right? You want the inner child to become an inner adult. And then you devour it so that it, uh, there is no longer you and it. There's just you. That's the point of inner child work, to create inner adults. Aaron mentions or associating distress of all kinds with specific traumas that are unrelated. Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah. But I, I kind of think that's the the flavor of the time. You know, every time has its unique struggles of the nafs of the ego, yeah. shall we say, and perhaps that is one of the flavors of this time. So, if you want to be a member of the Sarmoon Brotherhood, it's also the Sarmoon Sisterhood, by the way. Yeah, I mean, just, I'm, uh, I'm the Sarmoon LGBTQ whateverhood, <laughs> right? Nobody cares how somebody identifies. Everybody's welcome. Um, but if you want to be part of the group, all you have to do is take the tools and use them and keep using them until you have become an adult who can maintain the awakened state. And then, boom, you are in the Sarmun. And you discover the Sarmun have no messages. They have nothing to tell you. Because why should they? You're already where you need to be. Welcome to the siblinghood. Thanks, yeah. Aaron, for that. <laughs> yep, that reminds me of uh, Steve Perry's books. Uh, who uh, he, he created this, this group of the kind of Shaolin types that were known as the siblings of the shroud. Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. So. They, were, they were great fun. Cool. I'm going to look into that. Jonathan, I see you're unmuted. Yeah. So you said something like to be part of these popular groups is like feeding of McDonald's. Yeah. That's implying that there's a better grade of food out there. Yes. How would this better grade of food uh, feel or what, what, where could it take me? That's it's different. Do the practices and find out. I could tell you what it's like, but that it's very much like trying to ex to describe green to somebody who's been blind from birth. Or you could go and watch a couple of videos of somebody who has been deaf their entire life. They get a cochlear implant and the first time it's turned on and they hear something, watch their face. That's kind of what it's like. Because you're getting actual nourishment, not the illusion of nourishment. McDonald's is the illusion of nourishment. You know, McDonald's is, or, you know, the, the pseudo gurus out there are giving you bags of potato chips as opposed to uh, a good salad and a steak. So have you ever spent a long time eating really crappy food? <laughs> I never have. Never. <laughs> no, I'm crazy like that. I figured out that eating good food is a very good thing to do since I was 20. So well, I applaud I've you never, for that. I, I've yes. never not done that. Yeah. Good. Many of us, especially when we were in college, learn to eat 
really shitty food to try and get by and paid the price for it. Yeah. Though I do know 14 different ways to prepare ramen from, yep. from that experience. We've learned how to, uh, what's the word? I don't know. It's like upgrade, you know, upgrade the cuisine. Just yeah, everyday but, things like ramen. <laughs> but think of a person who has been eating crap for most of their life. And all of a sudden, they, they are, for whatever reason, being given a diet that is healthy and wholesome. The changes that happen are very much like the changes that we're talking about. You start getting the real energy, everything gets better. It takes work to maintain that, though. Yes. And after that initial high, after that initial honeymoon period, you have to find another way to stay motivated than just, ooh, it's new and shiny and exciting and it, it feels good. You have to decide. You have to apply will. Stick to the commitment that you've made to do things that are nourishing for yourself. Yeah, Aaron says, the quality of my food bounces around and I always notice the difference. Yep. So remember, Mr. G noted that there are three foods. There is the physical food you eat, there is your breath, and there is your impressions. And they are all related to each other. And the quality of each of those has an effect. But nobody who does this or teaches this is ever going to get rich and famous. Because it's not as sexy as the illusions. Illusion is very sexy. The truth is just there, you know. Roger, Roger Zelazny uh, wrote a book, it was more of a novella called The Jack of Shadows. And it's it, a world where people, when they uh, are killed, reincarnate. And they aren't like reborn, they just reappear in uh, what are called the dung pits of something or other. And they come out of this gigantic pile of dung. And every time it happens, and you have a lot of lives, they could be finite. But every time it happens, when you wake up, in your hand is a stone. And people get up and they look at the stone and they throw it away. And they go off to do whatever it is they do until they get killed again. And what we find out by the end of the story is the stone is actually their soul. So, in a sense, this is a little bit like that. Of If you are caught up in the illusions, uh, you're throwing your, your soul away every time you emerge from the dung pit. Now, is, is that not a lovely metaphor to come <laughs> There's a lot of like bodily fluids. Is <laughs> yeah, but the illusion that these guys went to was very sexy. It's like, oh, I got to get back to my castle and my minions and all of that. And they look at this kind of dull gray stone and it's like, yeah, there's nothing here. Throw it away. So, there you have it, folks, the secret of the solar moon, which is you just use the tools. You don't have to find no secret group. The tools are not secret. They are there for anybody to use. Aaron's waiting for his decoder ring, though. Okay, we got to get him a decoder ring. <laughs> Oh, man.
So yeah, I mean, the, the magic is not a secret. Let's put it that way. It's everywhere. It is waiting for us to pick it up and utilize it. Yep. So questions, thoughts, comments, tell us things. Otherwise we go off and we make dinner. Aaron's got a can of Ovaltine to finish up so we can get to that ring. Yay. <laughs> All right, everyone. Any, uh, yeah, Sheree. I was just thinking about how you just reminded me about how we're investing our energy. So what you put your focus on. So it's easy to get caught up in the attractiveness of certain things. And I recently had an experience of going back into a commercial bank where I used to work in a similar situation with high stress. And I looked at all of these people and I thought, wow, you used to be my people. And I thought, I've given all of that away. And it was such a good feeling. And it really does remind me this talk is that what we invest into whether it's our appearance and the clothes we wear and the different sort of um, dogma and marketing that people put out to you you know you if you're awake you can see it for what it is and it's it's so temporary and the vitality you lose in ensuring that you look just like the group just like them you're following everything you've got your uniform on you know the the makeup, the false eyelashes. Oh my God, what a pain in the butt to try and keep that going. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't do that. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is easy to get sucked in, but when you are, it's Empress New Clothes and you just gotta wake up and say, hey, what does this really taste like? What is this really doing for me? You know, and who really loves you in, in the middle of a crisis? Because those people drop you like a hot stone. They don't want to know because you don't fit. You're not doing the thing. You're not part of the group again. You know, so it's really seeing it things for what they are. Real people, you know, will step in in the midst of the shit. <laughs> Climb out with you. Give you a helping hand. But people don't really want to do that. They don't want to do that. They want to have the look, you know. And once we can let go of that and see what it is to be really an adult. I mean, that's one of the most powerful messages I have got out of these talks is not about finding your inner child. It's like, grow up, grow up, get a grip. Come on, you know, let that go. <laughs> the investment we put into trying to remember all the details of trauma and everything. Every person I've met has had something difficult in their life. But the ones who are really growing don't really care to remember the details and regurgitate them <laughs> that's what it is isn't it it's yeah. don't want that stuff back on me again we don't need to hear that move away from that don't touch it don't touch it you know as an adult yeah no don't have to do that again not saying it wasn't painful but it was like huh, okay where's my vitality going to be spent on in this moment that's what my my practices are for you know to grow up yeah. And thank you, Sheree. Yeah. I'm glad you're able to walk out of the bank like that was a prior life. <laughs> yeah. Um, tying back to the Star Moon Brotherhood, I mean, we don't have to do anything that is out of our it, there's nothing fake, you know, if you want to join the siblinghood, you really just have to focus on yourself and put in the time to care for yourself by doing things that help you grow up, essentially. Yeah, do your practices. Sometimes you'll meet other people who are also into doing the practices, then you can do them together and it's a lot more fun. And then you're all part of the Sarmoon Brotherhood and you can get funny hats. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hats are good. Funny hats, hats are, are better. very good. Yeah. <laughs> we can all turn up and have a funny hat day. 
<laughs> we did that a while back. Or we could do beautiful hat day, but Levita's already celebrating that. So yeah. she's got yeah, a head Levita's start. got us all, all, all beat with the hats. <laughs> All right, everyone. So I, uh, I guess we can uh, leave it at that. Go yeah, on no. Brady Bunch mode. Uh, let's just check with everybody. Ailey, have you got any thoughts? You usually have some good thoughts about this stuff. Uh, yeah, I think it's all about uh, uh, the practice of uh, self-witnessing and to be and, and to play your world worldly role, to play it well, so to live a hybrid life. And when you do the self-witnessing, what's what I experience is uh, the the I do call it the, the vibration is is uh, higher and smoother. Yeah, and and for me, you said the the food, bread, and impressions, and I noticed the bread and the impressions are very important. And uh, when you are in the world twenty four, the impressions getting much much better. It is a very nice food. Yes. Yeah, I have often thought that there are certain like teacher plants that give you a glimpse of of that, like touching world 24. And that's why everything looks so bright and sparkly. Could be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's a reference to Gurdjieff's. Uh... Yeah. His, uh, his ray of creation, yeah. that's what he calls yeah. it. Yeah. Or as we call it, the constraints upon the model. Yep. Thanks for that, Ailey. Levita, do you have anything you'd like to share? Um, the only thing I can think of is that I the only thing that comes to mind is keep practicing until you think you know what you're doing, and then forget all of that and start over. There's is, there is yeah. something to that. Yeah. 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 Because there's always more to learn, you know, mastery. Kind of, is, yeah. You're never done when it comes to mastery. Yeah. Yeah. I think the trick is, um, I forget who said it, but somebody said once, patience is not waiting. Patience is what you do while you're waiting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I never, never, ever pray for patience. Not yes. never. I had an I had an auntie that did that once, and then oh, the next no. year she was oh. given so many opportunities to be patient. Yeah, like, that's like, yeah, that's yeah, that's like asking. Well, how bad could it be? Never. <laughs> don't ask yeah. Oh my don't god. Ever ask We've that. been asking that way too many times the last three years. Just yeah. Some somebody I was in a I was in a group a long, long, long time ago who was like, she got a breakthrough. It wasn't me. I wish it was. And she said, We should ask, how much better can this get? And everybody went, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yes. I should have asked that when I was buying my lottery ticket. Yeah, I know. I'm gonna write that down. I like that. Yeah. Thanks, Levita. That's actually probably one of those uh, profound truths. Yeah. Came yeah. Up with that in your circle. Hell yeah, props. Yeah, because if I'm with somebody and they go, eh, well, how hard could it be? How bad could it get? I immediately vacate because I don't want to be around <laughs> yeah. when we find out. <laughs> it's like going into the basement when there's funky noises, you know? Nope, right? I still got to see that, by the way. Mm. Me too. Yes. 
a recent film that just came out. Thanks, Sylvia. That's awesome. Shuri, did you have a, a thought? Nope. All right. Okay. Well, then, I'm going to switch to Brady Bunch mode. Brady Bunch mode. And here we are. Here we so, are. Yay. Thank you, folks, for joining us tonight uh, live from Solder Moon Studios. And uh, we will be back next week with something more interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I wave to all of you. We wave to each other. Everyone who's watching on the replay, hi and bye, and we will see you next time. Take care. Yep.